Welcome to a fresh episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Hey, if you're liking what you hear, please leave us a review. We would really appreciate it. Hello there. Thanks for checking out another episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by three trainers in the industry, and they really know their stuff on everything from drying to forensic restoration and everything in between. Uh, So I'm really excited to have them joining me, and we're going to talk specifically about forensic restoration training in this podcast. But I'm going to toss it right over to Chuck DeWald III and Chris Laney to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about the DeWald Drying Academy and go from there. So Chuck, let's toss it to you first. Introduce yourself. Tell us your background in the industry industry and a little bit about your academy. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for having us. Uh, Chuck, like you said, Chuck Dewall III, I have been in the industry since I was old enough to carry an air mover. My father had a uh, restoration company in Tennessee. So when I was five, that's what I was doing. I swore the last thing I would ever do was be in restoration. And here I am. I mean, I, and, and I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't have chosen anything else. Um, I, I, this will be my 20th uh, year anniversary of, of teaching um, our school. I, I bought the school for my father in 2005. And uh, again, uh, we had, you know, he had the very first hands on drying school in the world. You know, a lot of people copied the concept since, but what we've always stuck with is we want the truth. We're going to give the truth. We're going to teach people how to be, you know, do drying. Whether they are looking for the certification or not, I want them to be able to go dry to build them better than anybody else. And again, that comes down, a lot of that comes down to equipment and we take a lot of pride and being independent, test all this stuff and tell people what works what and what doesn't. But yeah, you can see the wall behind you. History. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You can see the wall Sorry, behind you. Lots, lots of colors. So yes, lots ma'am. of equipment yes, up there. Yeah, yes, perfect. Ma'am. Okay. And Chris, some of that, that go ahead. and the one piece up there is older than all of us. So, uh, yeah. I feel like. So I'll, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, seriously. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for having me on. Um, Chris Lay. Um, I started in this industry when I was 19 years old. Uh, started out cleaning carpet for a local Stanley steamer. Did that for a couple of years. And then me and my wife started a restoration company um, just less than a year after we got married. Um, so we've had that restoration company now for just under 20 years and still own and operate that company. And about three years ago, I got asked to speak at the RIA out in Phoenix. And they said this guy named Chuck DeWald was going to be the moderator. And so my whole career, just because I live in Northern Indiana, I always went down to the hydro lab where Kurt was at and I never made it down to Tennessee. So I didn't know him. And I figured, Hey, I better come down and meet this guy before he moderates our, our, uh, our talk. And so got the opportunity to meet him and, and come to the class and, uh, And, you know, a lot of the answers that Chuck and a lot of the things Chuck had been working on for his whole career were things that uh, that I had worked on with with Kurt. But we never were able to dial into those algorithms and have the the correct math and science to get. We knew where we wanted to get and we knew what we wanted to accomplish. But, uh, you know, when I sat in Chuck's class, it was kind of an aha moment for me. So had the opportunity to be a part of the team now for a couple of years here at the DeWalt Academy and uh, you know, the, the rest moves forward. Last thing I'll say, the funny thing too, Michelle, is when he came down to drive two hours and oh, yeah. find out from the moderator what we're going to be talking about, I, I said, I have no idea. I said, That's a great. I said, I said, I said we'll, well, we'll make it up when we get there. So he's driven two hours after drive all the way back. I was like, well, it's good to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> I can it was all to be prepared, that. right? It was all to be prepared, and, and uh, <laughs> that, that preparation went well. We even talked about it about 10 minutes before – that talk. Hey, what are we going to talk about? We'll be good. We'll we'll just go. (laughs) I totally get that. As somebody who moderates things too, I've had people come to me and I'm like, I don't know. All right, Mr. Jones, let's toss it over to you. This is Jeff Jones. He is from Biosheen and he has the microbial warrior system for forensic restoration. He knows all the things when it comes to forensic restoration, has an amazing background in the servant's heart. So Jeff, let's have you introduce yourself a little bit more. You know, anytime somebody says, Mr. Jones, I always look over the shoulder for my dad, you know, and I wish he was here. My father started a carpet cleaning company back in 1966, and it was just a part-time gig to supplement his income and his family. In 1969, he quit his full-time job at Kraft Foods as a salesman and dove into the cleaning and restoration industry. That same year, there was a gentleman in his Sunday school class whose son had made the unfortunate decision to take his own life via firearm. All this guy knew was my father knew how to clean things. All my father knew 
was someone was hurting and he could go and help them. So he loaded up his cleaning supplies. And, you know, let's be honest, there was no real classes in how to clean that type of situation. In fact, there was not even the term crime scene cleaner, which I hate. Um, but dad went out there and when he got there, remember, this is 1969. Things moved at a different pace. So there, there were still two detectives there and they stopped him at the door and asked if he were family. And he said no. And they said, well, you're not going in because the medical examiner has not recovered the body yet. Who are you? And he said, I'm the gentleman that's going to clean this up. And they said, you know how to do that? What does anybody's dad say? Yes. yes. And so, yeah, correct. And so that was uh, his first job in 1971 when I was 12. We used to be open our family's cleaning business. We did water restoration, carpet cleaning, upholstery cleaning, and oriental rugs. But we would be open half a day so on Saturdays so that people could pick up their rugs. I was in the back working on some fringe, and I wanted my dad to come and inspect it. Because just like Chuck's dad, we found out we had so much in common. We're both from Tennessee. We both worked for our fathers. We both swore to God we were never going to do this. Okay. And our dads were both disciplinarians and uh, very hard taskmasters. And so uh, I wanted dad to say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and get his approval on it. But uh, the general manager was up front and I said, where's my father? And he said, he went to go look at a suicide scene. And uh when he got back, uh, I asked him, I said, where have you been? Like, I didn't know. And he said, well, I went to go look at a suicide site, which today we call a self-cessation. And uh, I asked him, I said, can I, can I go help you? And he said, no. I said, dad, come on, I can help you. You know, I can, let, let me go with you. Here are the two reasons I got to go. One, I spent my summers on a farm in Tennessee and I understood the cycle of life. I mean, if we were going to have bacon, well, we had hogs. If we were going to have chicken on Sunday, you had to catch them on Saturday. But the main reason I got to go, number two, and this is the big one, my mom was out of town. And so my <laughs> father said, if you tell your mother, I will wear your butt out. Okay, this is 1971, and you could legally do that. You know, yeah. yeah. Corporal punishment wasn't judged. It was graded. My dad got an A. Okay? So, yes. so that was my that introduction to that. Many years later, in the 1980s, we did what is classified now as an unattended death. In the world of forensics, there's four types of death. Homicide, suicide, accidental, and natural. Any one of those can become an unattended death. If the deceased is not discovered, human decomposition begins approximately four minutes after death. This individual had been there for a couple of weeks. It was the summer. It was the August. They'd left the window open. Vectors had come in, flies. And the fly larvae count, maggots were through the roof. Dad and I went out, and it took us a day and a half to remediate this in this small bathroom and then uh, the cleaning and disinfecting. And when it was over, we went back to the shop. We went back to work. We never talked about it. But the next morning, we were always the first ones in to the shop. I had coffee going. I was sipping a cup. My father walked in with a really serious look on his face. And he just said, I don't want to do that anymore. And I said, you don't want to do what anymore? He said, I don't want to do any more death scene cleanup. And I said, why not? He said, son. I took two showers when I got home. It's the last thing I thought about when I went to sleep. And it's the first thing I thought about when I got up this morning. You know, we couldn't even spell PTSD back then. And what he was doing was very smart. He was putting up a wall to protect himself. And I said, well, dad, I want to continue to do this. I think it's a very valuable and viable service that we offer. And by at that point, I'd done a lot of jobs with dad. And my father looked at me and he said, well, you're good at it. And who knows, maybe one day you'll take it to a different level. But son, all I've got to say is this, the day you're not going to treat it as a ministry, close the doors and go do something else. And that is exactly how we treat it today. And when he said ministry, he did not mean go out and hit people over the head with a King James Bible. The word itself means to administer aid. Let me jump ahead. 
many years later, because dad never saw it as a standalone industry, uh, which it is today. But many years later, now my wife, Lori, who's been at this for 15 years, and she is the cutest certified bioforensic restoration specialist on this planet. And I get points every time I say that. So we're at, a, she's at her first cleaning and restoration convention. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. See that guy right there? She goes, yeah. I said, that is Chuck DeWald. She said, who is he? I said, Wow, he has revolutionized the world of structural drying. I said, what I really respect about him is he's a real searcher for the truth. He just got really tired of the industry politics and claims of this and claims of that. And he just went out and started searching for the truth. He already did it. Now he's taking these pieces of equipment and he's testing them and he's putting everything through the test to find the truth. And, you know, Lori is like, well, why don't you make some introductions? And, you know, I'd always shaken his hand. And, you know, I don't think that either one of them knew how much I admired him for stepping out beyond political boundaries and doing his own thing. But, you know, there's an old saying that goes back uh, to the movie Billy Jack that was released in 1969. A man who doesn't go his own way is nothing. Well, Chuck DeWald has gone, gone his own way. And so at the last experience convention in Las Vegas, I finally met Chuck the third. Okay. And immediately we just warmed up to each other because what are we after in different avenues? The truth. And then we found out, oh, we're both from Tennessee. Oh, you got your butt kicked by your dad, too? Oh, oh, wow, you weren't going to do this either? Holy moly, we're twin sons of different mothers. That's exactly how it went down. <laughs> and, you know, Jeff, you remarked about drying uh, politics and drying. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think there's any politics in the drying world at all. <laughs> None in that situation, period. Yeah. No. I, okay. So you guys met in Vegas. So what did the crossover look like? All right. We've got a drying Academy and we have a forensic restoration trainer. What does that look like? Where are we merging here? I don't know who wants to take a stab at that one, Chuck, maybe, well, but I'll start. And I'm just going to, the only reason that it's even an option is I'm very <clears throat> picky about who I work with or partner with. And so it started with that. And I knew within five minutes of talking to Jeff that somebody I wanted to work with. And again, <laughs> it was really Lori. Tell the truth. Yeah. No, no, no. So that that's number one. So it it I'm very picky about my name. Um, you know, it's it, it, it you know mainly because it started with my father, and you know it means a lot to me to carry on that name. And so when anybody's tied to it, um, that takes a lot for me to make that decision. And so uh, that was number one. It was a big deal. So that says a lot about Jeff um, in my book. But he he took the time to in with Lori to come to the class and see our facility. And, and, uh, and it just, and they just, it, it was like watching a little kid walk, you know, watch him walk around just like we could do this and this and this in this area. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm just glad to be, because again, I'm my experiences in water. I don't go outside my lane. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know more about water restoration, the science behind it than anybody in the world. I wrote that down when I was 22. And so that's been my mission. So I know nothing about what it is that he does, um, but I love working with people who have the mentality that he has. And so I just like being tied to another person that first off wants to be the best that has put the time and effort into it. And so right now, outside the relationship, we're offering our facility and we're excited to be you know, tied to somebody that has the same mentality that we have. Yeah. So Jeff, we, anything you want to add to that? You know, it really it doesn't matter which of the disciplines in the cleaning and restoration industry that you uh, decide to pursue or multiple avenues on that. Um, there's classroom um, learning, and that's what it is. Hey, listen, here's the deal. Little kids learn, warriors train. And while we're talking about the potential for deadly pathogens, bacteria and viruses, make no mistake in your mind, this is microbial warfare. OK, and so with training, you've got to simulate that world, that incident site as closely and safely as you possibly can. And um, Chuck's dad, Chuck DeWalt uh, Sr., 
Well, he's really the second, right, Chuck? He's junior, yeah. yeah. Junior, okay, and you're the third, okay? So I'm still learning all the nuances there that, you know, he's really the guy that had the vision to build uh, the first flood house. And everybody after that, well, you know, it's sort of like the uh, protocols and procedures for forensic restoration. It's been imitated, uh, and, and, but it's never been duplicated. L let me share a story with you really quick. Um, sometime back, Lori and I were invited to the Nuclear, Biological, Chemical, and Radiation Symposium in Croatia. And we were the only people from the cleaning and restoration world invited to this. These are doctors and scientists from the global community. It's not something that's advertised coming together to talk about uh, nuclear, biological, chemical, and radiation risk, and especially how this might be applied through like acts of bioterrorism. So we went and did a presentation on the protocols and procedures of forensic restoration and how these might be applied to uh, biological agents or chemical agents through acts of bioterrorism. We, we were voted best presentation of the whole conference. Then, you know, th these are not just guys in the cleaning community and God knows I love everybody there. OK, but these these we're getting validation now from some of the top international scientists that this protocol is sound and is true and will work. And it's just like Chuck's E3 evaporation there. Um, it's not just a theory. It's proven in science. It's backed by science. Forensic restoration is based on the sciences of bio-risk management and infection control, and it utilizes the techniques of forensic cleaning and professional disinfecting. That's what we've got in common. Everything that we're doing, Chuck and I, it's based on science, but then you've got to roll up your sleeves and get in that training environment. We've got to get ready for combat. Okay, so Chris, I want to toss it over to you for a second. So as a restoration owner, you know, virtual learning has come kind of a long way during the pandemic, right? And a lot of people have made shifts in their company to do more virtual and stuff like that. But there's still huge value in hands-on training. So can you talk a little bit about, as an owner, maybe to other owners or managers watching this, why hands-on learning can be so incredibly valuable, especially when it comes to knowing how to dry a structure or doing this forensic restoration? Yeah, I think it's it's exactly what Jeff was saying. Jeff was saying that, you know, hey, we all got to sit in the classroom, right? We all got to sit in the classroom and we got to take in that information and learn that information, but we got to be able to go apply it each and every day. And so here at the at the school and, and we bring our people through this school and then we still do continuing education for our guys at home. But it's it's always I've always wanted to do things hands on. Um, I've just, I've always learned that way. And a lot of guys, I think in the drying industry, learn that way too. They learn by going and doing those things. And so for us here, it's, it's going through and actually doing testing on extraction, using all the different tools of, of extraction, setting all the different types of air movers, um, you know, testing and showing them each an individual air mover, discussing the differences between the dehumidifiers, the desiccants, if they're large, using large desiccants or small portable desiccants. So going into all of those things, including heaters, yes. And, and I think that's what I appreciate the most about E3 and what it provides our industry is it gives us the ability to understand all of those tools and what they can do and provide for us. And then we can go apply that and go set those things up. And we, we challenge guys here to go back and take the files that you have to go look at those files and then review those files, see what looks good. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? And then go apply different things to it. And and when you can do that in a training atmosphere where guys can, they're going to make mistakes. And that's where you want to make the mistake. We want to make the mistakes while we're doing that hands-on training. And, and then that way, when we go out in the field and we apply it, it really just uh, starts to separate us from our, from our competition. And that's, that's what we're all trying to do in business. And, and as business owners, try to set our teams up so they can be successful when they go out there. And like Jeff said, we, we literally, you know, he's calling it, you know, going to war. And, and we do that when we walk into these people's homes. And, and it's not as, uh, in my opinion, it's not as emotionally um, catastrophic to that homeowner as what they're dealing with during a forensic restoration. But I always tell our guys, and, and we train on this too, is, 
you know, this might be the worst thing that's ever happened in these people's home. And it might only be the kitchen that's flooded. But the feeling that that person has in that moment is is devastation. And they don't know where to go, what to do. And they, their whole world's been turned upside down. The challenge, I think, for some people in the service industry is to realize this is your third water damage you've been to today. This is the first one they've ever seen in their life. And it's in their home. You need to be able to approach it at that same spot. And that and that a lot of that does go back to training yeah. um, and, and how we approach those things. Okay, so let's yeah, talk a little. Sorry, go ahead, John. Here's the, deal on, here's the deal on training, okay? Amateurs train till they get it right. Professionals train till they cannot get it wrong. I know this because I'm an FBI trained former SWAT team leader. So we didn't just train one time. Oh, we got it right. That's it. No, you keep going in. You keep going. It takes 3,000 repetitions of something to drill that into your central nervous system. There is no such thing as muscle memory. That's a myth. You have to drill that into your central nervous system. You want to make every mistake that you can make in training. And let me tell you, Chris just brought up a great point, okay, that that water loss in that home to some people, that might be the, the worst traumatic thing that they're going to experience. And I hope that it is, because if they've got some someone from the DeWalt Academy, that's going to be handled professionally. But here's where the similarities are. I used to live on the Navajo Indian Reservation. And the Navajo have this belief that for a person to live a long, healthy, and happy life, it's essential to live in balance. The Navajo word for that is hozo, H-O-H-Z-O. And that you have to live in that balance mentally, physically, and spiritually. When one of those elements are out of balance, you open up the door to sickness and death. Most traditional Navajo healing ceremonies, they're just ceremonies to restore the hozo. The balance. When someone calls a forensic restoration specialist or someone calls a graduate from the DeWalt School of Drying, the hozo, the balance in their life has been disturbed, sometimes violently. What we really do as restoration specialists, we go out and we restore the hozo, the balance in people's lives so that once again, people can live the nishoni the beautiful life and walk in beauty. That's what we do. There's our similarities. We could do a whole podcast on your relationship with the Navajo and how you've managed to work with them and everything. I love that. Anyway. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the microbial warrior experience. This isn't just a class where you're coming in for one day and you're learning a little bit and you're on your way. This is like way, way, way more than that. So I don't know who wants to start off with this one, but let's walk through kind of the outline of what this course looks like, how many days it is, the topics that are covered, those kind of things. Sure. You know, I run this course in the same way that the world that you're going to process this. I heard someone that was trying to copy what I do say that it all begins with a phone call. That's not true. Everything in life begins with a conscious thought. First, a person has a thought, this is something I want to do. I want to pursue. General Patton says the body follows the mind. And so someone has this conscious thought, I want to pursue this. So now I want to pursue education and training in this. So an operator starts to prepare themselves mentally, physically, and spiritually to get ready for things. You know, some people think it's, you know, hey, that's kind of corny and stuff. I don't really care. Let me tell you something. Everything, when you start to understand life, is spiritual. And only spiritual matters matter. So then this person makes the next decision. They go and they get training. Okay, training should try to replicate what is going on in the world. So how do you present yourself when you show up? How do you answer the phone? What is the critical incident data that you're going to need to obtain to prepare yourself and your team of forensic operators to respond to this type of incident site? What, what are you going to need for equipment? What type of vehicle? What type of equipment check do you need to have on that? How do you arrive? How do you do a site assessment? How do you properly zone off everything from your operation zone to your transition zone to your clear zone? The old, in the old days, they used to call it, you know, the work zone, the hot zone, the cold zone, and the clean zone. 
You know, clean is defined as the removal of soil, both visible and invisible. Forensic cleaning is defined as the removal of biological contaminants, both visible and invisible, to prepare surfaces, both vertical and horizontal, for professional disinfecting. How can that be the clean zone? I didn't clean it. You didn't clean it. Nobody cleaned it. So it's just clear. It's clear of everything that's associated with this site. So then how are we going to do our pre-testing? How are we going to do our pre-disinfecting? What are we going to use? What's our delivery system? How will we do a load reduction? How will we do forensic cleaning? All the training should follow the flow of a job. And then at the end, how do we write a professional invoice? What is the proper verbiages that we want to use to separate ourselves from the crime scene cleaner to the professional that we are, that we've invested all of this time and money? It's like, did you go to Clyde's Community College or did you go to Harvard? Okay, which is it? It will clearly show when you're dealing with family and relations and you're dealing with an insurance adjuster, how are you going to justify your charges? Let me tell the story really quick. Uh, in the last training session that we did, I had a couple in there. They had never done this type of work before. And so we're on day four that morning of the final day, and they got a call. They had already started their marketing. That was smart. Okay. So they got a call, and it was on an unattended death. And uh, the deceased had been there for a couple of weeks. And this is in Florida. So it's hot and it's humid. And so those are things that are going to accelerate human decomposition. And they got all nervous. And I said, why are you nervous? You've been through this training. You, you're going to know what to do. You know what to use. And you know what? Today, we're going to work even more on that. And when you leave this class, I don't throw people to the wind. Got your certificate, got your patch, catch you later. No, my phone is always open to them. So they went out. This is their first job. They did their site assessment. They did uh, their estimate. And um, the property owner needed to get three estimates. Okay. Usual story. And so they told me what theirs was. And I'm not going to hide anything on this either. Okay. They successfully negotiated. They landed it. And that was at $43,000. So they negotiated this in 3.5 days. And the other big crime and trauma scene cleaning company has submitted a bid for $130,000. So right before the project began, the big crime and trauma scene cleaning company showed up and they said, oh, we haven't heard from you. What's the deal? They said, no, we've gone with another vendor. They've got a very professional proposal laid out. They've shown exactly how they're going to do this based on sciences of bio risk management and infection control. And we're going to go with them. And I love it. And that nobody's hiding anything from anybody. They asked, well, what did they bid it at? And they said, 43,000. They said, well, we'll do it for 39. Where did their credibility go? Let me ask you that. They just, okay. In they the just, trash. They just added a one. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was <laughs> right. If, and you know what? I want to say their names because I'm so proud of them. That is uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Brian Argus, United States Marine Corps, and his lovely wife, Karen Argus, who's a retired nurse. So these people already had a warrior's passion and a servant's heart. You know, to them, it's a ministry. They just needed the tools and the training, the knowledge and the skill sets and the empowerment to go out and make the world a better place. They call me on a regular basis. They're going to be great. They are knocking it out of the park. Why? Because not only do they have knowledge and skill sets, they've got that servant's heart. Okay. To them, it's a ministry. They get it. Those are the ones that are going to be successful. Okay, so so Chris and Chuck, why? What makes the academy such a perfect place to host a class like this? And, you know, you have a good facility and you have the drying house and all of that. So, um, what makes your facility really good for a class like this? For Jeff's class, yeah. Well, um, I'll let Jeff. You know, because you know, like I said, when when he came walking through looking at our place, he was like, he's like watching like a kid in a candy store. He, he had that smile right there, which, which you see on screen. Um, 
you know, I had, you know, this was built for, for drying, of course, but yeah. we've got a, we've got a bunch of different layouts. We've got a bunch of different materials. Um, it's built just like a high, 1500 square feet, the actual flood house itself. We've got a, a crawl space area. We've got, so, so when Jeff started looking at it, he's just like, Chuck, you realize all the stuff I can do in here? I'm like, as long as you put it back, <laughs> that's the way you found it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but I'll let, I'll let Jeff comment on that. Okay. But, and, you know, of course we got the classroom as well, but, um, it, and it, it's, it's within a 30,000 square foot building that, you know, Jeff could go crazy in if he wanted to, just like I would, if I was, you know, when I, when I walk into a place, I'm like, you know, I would love to flood this place. I mean, I, I everywhere I go, that's what I do. And I'm sure Jeff looks, looks at it the same way. Jeff is known to bring in some uh, interesting props to his training to make sure that you really <laughs> learn how to do things. So, ahead, oh, you know, we, yeah, we utilized a flood house down in Florida earlier this year. And, uh, well, the students went a little crazy with the biologicals because I told him I had this broken down into Alpha, Bravo, Charlie and Delta team. And I said, you're going to contaminate that and you're going to contaminate this. I said, <laughs> and then tomorrow we're going to rotate. And so Alpha, you're going to be remediating what Bravo team did. And then Charlie, you're going to be remediating what Delta team did. And we're at the Pure Clean facility. And I'm talking to Darren Houdima, who's a great guy. And we've been outside for about 45 minutes. And I was like, oh, yeah, let me go in and see what these guys are doing. And I walked inside. Oh, no. And it was the biggest mayhem I have ever seen <laughs> in my entire This would have kept Stephen King up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And I walked into the bathroom and I was like, wow, I've been, I'm in my 50th year of doing it. And I'm like, I haven't even seen that yet. So I was like, hey, <laughs> hey stop. Everybody stop now. And everybody stopped. I said, who did the bathroom? And everybody pointed at this one guy was like, come here. And then he's a big individual. And uh, I was like, kneel down. I don't want to say this loud. And he, he was like, yes, sir. I said, you're a sick individual. Okay. <laughs> and I love you. Okay. And so the next morning, everybody was all excited. So the next morning, everybody came to class and I said, okay, there's been a slight change of plans. You know how yesterday you got all excited about contaminating with biologicals, your area, because somebody else was going to clean it up. And you're like, boy, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll fix them. And everybody's like, yeah. I said, now you're going to clean what you contaminated. Yes. <laughs> oh. Uh -huh. and Darren was like, I think you've ruined my flood house. <laughs> and no, when it was when it was done, you would never ever have guessed that that type of mayhem had occurred in there. And not only, you know, anybody can there's two reasons to clean anything, appearance and health. You can clean for appearance and still have a biologically hostile environment. We took multiple ATPs before, during, and after. It was cleaner when we were done than when we started. Okay. And one of the students, um, in fact, he has a, a degree in aeronautical engineering. I said, so you're a rocket scientist? He goes, well, yeah, basically I did some projects with NASA. He told me he went the next day after class, he was like, did we really do that? He said, he went in there. He said, it smelled so clean and fresh. He inspected everything. He's like, this is absolutely incredible. And in fact, he stays in touch with me. He's out in, his name is Bob Jordan. And he's with Pure Clean out in the uh, uh, Washington state area. And we talk on a regular basis. That's what people, that's what happens when we train with people. Okay. They become part of a tribe, okay? Mm -hmm. They're like, in the old days among the Cheyenne, there was a military society. And what this military society did was not only were they the first in, in combat and in war and the last ones to pull out, but they looked after the old people and they looked after the young people. And this military society was known as the Hotomotanio, the dog soldiers. And that's exactly what we produce. We produce forensic hotomatineo, dog soldiers. I love it. Okay. Start using that. Well, I, I need him to re say that one more time. <laughs> I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> I can All use these the words. dog and the soldier. 
Yeah. For anybody that knows well, Jeff, right? Every time you're on the phone, phone with Jeff, you learn another phrase that's yeah. Navajo or whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to remember that. I don't, I need to start or, writing them or, down. Or a good quote from a movie too. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So um, before we wrap this up, I love having people tell stories on my podcast. And so I would love for each of you, Jeff, you've kind of shared a story, but you have a lot. So you have to share another one. One of your favorite stories, either from training or from a job that you've been on. So Chris, maybe it's a memorable mm-hmm. job you've had. I don't know, Chuck, if you want to talk training, Jeff, you could be on either side of the aisle. I don't know who wants to go first, but I love hearing stories from restorers, the jobs that really like stick in their minds and kind of what you've learned from it. So I don't know who wants to go first, but yeah, well, yeah, we'll go ahead. We 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 had the privilege of being on a couple hundred uh, commercial losses this last year or so. Um, which one you, you pick? One, you pick? know, I think I think the one that probably hits home to me most on on some of those commercial jobs, and and some of them were you know the Sears Tower and some of these big yeah. projects. But one of the ones that hit home the most was we got the opportunity to go down to uh, the museum district down there in Pensacola. And during the second storm that came through last year, Pensacola got, got some damage down there. And I think just the relationship that was built with um, the gentleman that ran the museums, his appreciation for what we were doing, um, the time he spent with us, sitting at lunch with him and just being so thankful because he had worked so hard as a curator of these seven museums to take care of them and for them to have that damage and for us to come in and say, no, we can dry these things. We don't need to tear this place apart. We don't have to tear anything out. We can, these, you know, we, if the temperature has got to be a specific temperature, it cannot be over this. It's just, he had all these parameters for these artifacts that were irreplaceable and not a problem. We'll take care of you. We can execute exactly on what you need. And, and when we were done, I think the thing that hit home the most, it wasn't us that got it because we didn't deserve it. The contractor that brought us in to do it, got a key to the city. And that was probably one of the cooler moments to just know that we were a part of that and, uh, and know how appreciative that gentleman was through that process. Do contractors bring you as, in as consultants? That- yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so we, yeah. we were the one who set up the whole we protocol. We sized everything. Yeah. You know, we went in, they said, this is our spec. And so there was no power. So we, we did all the math using the algorithms of E3 that I've come up with over the last 15 years to, to get mm-hmm. it right where it was supposed to be. And, but it, but the biggest thing was we explained all of this to the curator through, through the entire process. And in fact, he was asking us questions about soccer. I mean, he he was so involved with it and just felt so. I don't know. It, it was it was a great. It was experience. his passion yeah. for what he did, right? Yeah. And now we were there to help him. He was thankful, but he wanted to be a part of it. He wanted to understand exactly what was going on, why it was happening, and how that would affect some of these artifacts. That, as I said, I mean, these things are older than all of us combined, right? I mean, these things were, it, it was just cool to, to walk through the museum and see the things that they had put together and, and the fact we were able to help them through that process was neat. And, and the contractor to, to get a key to the city kind of just basically puts the check mark at the end of the job and saying, you know what, that's, that's why we do what we do. You, we all try to put food on the table for our families, but you know, we all do this because we enjoy helping others in a time of need. So that was, uh, that was a cool, cool moment. My turn. Yeah, you do. Okay, my, there's so many to pick from, but then the Sears Tower one was it, or the Willis Tower was it? I think we had 105 uh, deskants on that. I mean, trailer mounted that. That was a fun job. But oh. the, my, one of my favorite experiences was we were in Lake Charles, and we got brought in as consultants for a. It was an eight-story uh, housing authority building that had three different wings to it. Um, I think each floor was thirty thousand. Anyway, it was, so we had a hundred thousand CFM of deskants. No, there's no power, so it was all we had three or four megs of, of generator power, and uh, we had like 600 tons of cooling brought in. Because, and anyway, so I'm not going to detail, I'm not going to name names because it started off bad. So I'd, I've been brought in and I did all the math and I told them exactly how to set it up. Um, and of course, they didn't listen. And so then the insurance company comes in with uh, their consultant. Um, it was JSL, which I, I love JSL people. In fact, we're going to start training them. I get along with them real well. But And they had a right to be upset because that, they had hundreds of laborers in there. It was 105 degrees in the building, and the grains were like 120 or something like that because they had not set it up the way I told them to do it. So Chris and I get a call. We were going out to schools to look at a big school system, and they said, Chuck, you need to get here right now. And I said, okay. So we turned around, came back. 
And long and short, I looked at the guy that I had told to set it up, and I said, you're going to be big for this, okay? So we went down and sat at the table with the insurance company and uh, the consultants on the other side. And I said, guys, I'm not going to talk about whose fault this was. I mean, I'm here to, I'm here to make this right. I said, where do you want the temperature to be at inside tomorrow? And uh, the, guy, the consultant from JSA said, I want it 80 degrees. I said, yes, sir. And so, again, there's no, there's no power in the building, no cooling, no anything. And, uh, and again, we know what their protocol is for humidity, which I don't care about. I know what the grains need to be at. So um, I made the change. We, we reset 19, de- how many decimals? 19 decimals that we had there. All the cooling, we, you know, we, we'd uh, post-cooled them instead of pre-cooled them. Anyway, so we came in the next day, and I made the consultant walk with me off, off through eight floors. The average temperature of the entire building was 80.4 degrees. And he'd wanted an 80. Again, this is with no thermostats, no nothing like that. And so it, I'll never forget the guy, the, the consultant from the other side said, okay, you all don't need me here anymore. He goes, just whatever Chuck says, that, that's what I would do. And he goes, I got other, other jobs to go look at. And so, and, and I, do, I do that not to brag on that. It's a lot of the restorers think they have an adversarial relationship with adjusters and, and consultants. And it all comes down to a lack of information. It's not because they're trying to be pricks. I just gave the guy the information and he goes, Chuck, I just wish everybody else would be like this. He yeah. goes, I, I mean, I can't argue with the thing you're saying, nor do I want to, because I just want this job handled, you know, correctly and my customer taken care of. And so people, restorers think that adjusters and, and, and consultants are against them and it couldn't be further from the truth. It's just, they've not done a good job explaining what they're doing or why they're doing it. But anyway, that, that was a fun job. That's amazing. That's really good. Okay. All right, Jeff, your turn. Well, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to do a long story thing because yeah, anybody that knows me, I'll, I'll just go down rabbit holes and start telling stories all day long. <laughs> but one of my favorites was Lori's first job, you know, and then a little over 15 years ago when she decided she wanted to do this with me, I said, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I grandfather in on anything, but um, I would be uh, happy if you went and took like let's go take IICRC's two-day crime scene cleaning course. I mean, you know, that would be a good thing for you to do, to walk in with some basic education and some certification. I'll take it with you. She's like, really? Yeah. So we went and took it and just got home and we got a job and it was on an unattended death. And so we went out and looked at it and I don't really, I'm not an eloquent speaker to describe how bad this was. Okay. But it was an unsanitary dwelling doesn't begin to describe what this gentleman lived in. He lived in his own filth and fecal matter. And just, you know, we show actually slides from this during training to show you just how bad this can get. But he was also obese and he passed on his sofa and nobody missed him because he, you know, he had cut off his whole social circle. So he decomped and it turned it took six firefighters to get the body outside and four of them threw up you know the apartment manager's telling us this and she won't even go near this place so Lori and I go in and we start to look around and Lori goes oh my god are they all this bad I went yeah it's <laughs> nothing and she goes Lori, she's, she's second thinking the whole deal right there I can see the fear in her eyes I said no, I said, listen, I don't know if this is the worst, but it's in the top two. This is bad. <laughs> it's really, really bad. Okay. But the pride that she had when we were done with it, I mean, it was incredible night and day difference. And I had to go get the property manager and she's walking down. She said, do you have any protective gear? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, I'm a germaphobe. I really don't want to go in there, but my boss says I have to, you know, to give clearance so you guys can get paid. I was like, I've got gear for you. And she said, and you're, you're fine. You're not walking in. I said, no, it's totally remediated. Now this is good. It's a very healthy environment. Now she walked in and Lori's standing there and walked around and looked at it and her mouth opened up and she asked my favorite question in the world. Wow. How did you do this? And I could see the smile on Lori's face and she got it. She got it. This is what we do, you know? And uh, that was just 
So, but, but you know what both these stories have in common? It's a commitment to excellence. You know, my dad said, Jeff, you can chase perfection and that's a lofty goal and you're never going to achieve it. But if you work smart enough and run fast enough, you just might catch excellence. We don't say the right thing part of the time. We don't do the right thing part of the time. Excellence is a commitment. It's a full-time thing. That goes back to Aristotle, okay? And that definitely goes back to Chuck's dad and my dad. Commitment to excellence. Awesome. Yes, it does. Well, hopefully you guys have some um, students that go through the microbial warrior experience that then have clients later that get that, wow, how did you do this? Like, hopefully you're going to train more restorers that are going to get that response from customers. I want, I want people to come in and to leave with the knowledge, skill sets, and empowerment to go out and make the world a better place. But I want them to get excited about changing their lives also. Yeah. And, and I believe, Jeff, I've heard you say this, and of course I've done it from day one. <clears throat> we both make the, the guarantee that if you come through, it's not the best class you've ever experienced, then I'll give you your money back. Absolutely. I think Jeff does the same thing. So Absolutely. And, and I'll play for your plane ticket, food, everything. Yeah, this isn't the best training that you've ever got, okay? If you don't leave here with a formula for success, okay, you don't owe me anything. I never had to give that money back in 20 years, so I'm, I'm, sure I'm assuming the same with you. That's a good track record. I love it. <laughs> All right. All right. Do you guys have a specific date for when this is going to happen? I know it's going to be early next year. People can go to structuraldryingacademy.com to find out specifics and get registered and stuff like that. Do you have any other specifics that you want to share at this point? Yeah, I, I think it's the it's the third or the fourth. And, uh, you know, uh, man, I just I'm like a good soldier. I go where I'm told that's going to be that's going to be we'll, posted we'll, like Mundo Pronto really quick. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll put it on the website. Yeah. 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 Perfect. And you'll, you'll also be able to get those dates at the uh, APTA, the Artemis Biorisk Training Academy. So, you know, there'll be two sources there for information and uh um, listen, if you have a hard time with that, it's 405-820-3638. Call me. Okay. And any trainer that's too busy to answer his phone, you don't want him. Yeah. Touche. All right. Perfect. And I will post stuff on the CNR website as soon as you have it as well. So gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Anything else you want to add before we wrap it? No, what, what no, a great, thank you, Michelle. And an honor it is for me to be a, a, among you guys. And uh, I, I'll leave you with one last one, okay? On petukililo washtekola. That means, friend, this day has been very good. For more restoration today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com, or find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts.